Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Good evening. Today is April 1st, and this morning we released a podcast episode with Dr. Kristen Dawson on PTSD, depression, and anxiety and frontline providers during the pandemic and what you can do to support those frontline providers. This evening, we look at the United States. As of Tuesday evening, last night, the CDC reported 186,000 confirmed cases and 3,600 deaths in the United States. This represents a 14% increase in cases and 26% increases in deaths from the previous day. The case fatality rate right now is 1.94%. This afternoon, Worldometer, as of 1.40 p.m. Eastern, reports 205,000 cases in the United States and 4,516 deaths. This is a doubling time of 2.6 days, which would put us at the current pace of 10,000 deaths in the U.S. by this Friday. In global updates, the Financial Times has changed its coronavirus trajectories to focus on new case counts rather than running totals. Today, their data showed that Italy has turned a corner with fewer new cases this week than the previous week. China and South Korea are the only other countries who have shown a similar decline in new cases, although China did see a rise in new cases after the lockdowns were lifted. With more than 20% of the world's cases, the United States is the global epicenter of the outbreak. Italy's death toll appears to be plateauing, but the death rate in the United Kingdom, United States, and Spain continue to rise as we seem to be a little behind. In other news, the urban epicenter of the outbreak continues to be New York, where the death toll is rising faster than any other subnational region in the world. Within 31 days, New York City went from one case to more than 47,000 confirmed cases and 1,096 deaths in just the city itself. Florida has also become a hotspot of new cases, becoming one of eight states to have surpassed 5,000 cases. Of those states, however, Florida is the only one that has not issued a statewide stay-at-home order. The governor stated that he had no plans to do so because the White House has not told him to. The Surgeon General, however, has defended the White House's avoidance of issuing a national statewide stay-at-home order, stating the decision should be left up to governors. So let, 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 me re, let me restate that. The Surgeon General has said that the White House is not going to issue a nationwide stay-at-home order because it should be the decision of the governors, yet the governor of Florida has stated that he has no plans to issue statewide stay-at-home orders because the White House has not told him to. I just want to restate yeah, that. It sounds, ju- it sounds just as bad when you say it in reverse. Yeah. <laughs> The Washington Post reports that preliminary data from California shows that, like in Washington state, social distancing measures appear to be flattening the curve and may have even reduced the expected death toll by 1,000 cases. That's up until today. California and Washington were the first in the nation to report cases of COVID-19 and the first to enact statewide stay-at-home orders. The spread of the virus appears to be slower in these states than currently seen in the East Coast. The San Francisco Bay Area locked down 16 days ago. In comparison, the rate of confirmed cases per capita in New York City, which locked down 11 days ago, is currently 17 times that of the Bay Area. And that just speaks to the speed at which actions need to be taken. Uh, And you put that in context of the 
uh, Florida information we just stated. And uh, this is just, we're just kind of stressing what has worked, what has not worked, because some of us uh, still have time uh, to implement proper precautions. Looking at recent literature, uh, today in nature.com, a study was published showing that 80% of U.S. intensive care COVID-19 cases have been found to have underlying conditions. So this is similar to data gathered in Italy and China, but this is the first such study of patients in the United States. A few days ago on March 28th, a report from the CDC supported findings from other countries that people with underlying chronic health conditions face a higher risk of severe illness due to COVID-19, regardless of age. The report identifies people with diabetes, chronic lung disease, and cardiovascular disease as particularly high risk. Experts advise that people with such conditions should take extra precautions to avoid infection and should have a much lower threshold for seeking medical care should they develop symptoms of COVID-19. This is important because it's just pointing out the people who really need to be even more careful and the, those conditions listed diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic lung disease. We have large populations of those in the United States. So if you have one of those conditions, definitely stay at home, be careful. You're at much higher risk. According to an article published by modernhealthcare.com, Medline Industries is pursuing FDA approval for a plan that's going to involve basically re-sterilizing thousands of healthcare workers' face masks because the sterilization, sterilization services just recently resumed at one of their facilities. This could be huge because we know that there's only a certain number of masks that can be made and our need may very well uh, be beyond what our current industrial capacities are. Tomorrow morning, we're releasing a podcast specifically on should you, as the general public, be wearing masks in public, and we're going to give you our thoughts on that and compare that to the WHO and CDC guidelines. On March 30th, JAMA Network released an article discussing the number of older clinicians and healthcare workers that are currently in the workforce. I put this on our Instagram account, which is Wild Health MD, uh, but wanted to mention it briefly on the podcast. This is important because they they looked at the number of clinicians, nurses that were currently in the in the workforce over 55 years old, and it turns out 22 percent of our nurses are over 55, and 29 percent of physicians are over 55. Now, I'm sure you can understand why that's important because people who are over 55 have a substantially increased risk of se severe progression of COVID-19 as opposed to younger people. Obviously, we have to have some concern about our healthcare workers. What's surprising me, Matt, is I have heard relatively little discussion about keeping older healthcare workers, physicians and nurses at home rather than putting them on the front lines and facing the virus. Today is a short update. Tomorrow, we're going to be answering the question of should you wear a mask? Should the general public wear a mask? We've been looking at this, and we do have an opinion. It's a slightly nuanced one, a little too nuanced for a one-liner here. And finally, we issued a challenge several days ago for everyone in the nation to support the frontline providers uh, in your community and to tell us about that. Um, today, I received a very heartwarming and kind of inspirational call. A CEO of a tech company reached out. Uh, when he heard that I was working extra shifts in the ER instead of my normal role as CEO of Wild Health. And he basically offered to cover for me and help run the company while I was kind of, quote unquote, deployed to the front lines. It was an unexpected call. It was really kind. And it was the kind of selflessness that we hope everyone shows. I'm not going to name the person here to protect their privacy, but I will just say I was very touched and I want to thank that person very much. Let us know what you're doing on Instagram or Facebook at Wild Health MD, how you're supporting frontline providers. And today on the 1st of April, what I will say too is that I believe this month uh, here in the United States is the critical month. I know we're all getting really tired of the physical distancing, but it's not going to last forever. And I think the actions that we take this month in April of 2020 are going to have massive repercussions for life lost. And so I would just encourage everyone to hold the lines, be patient, and we're going to get through this together. Thanks so much for listening to this COVID-19 update. Please send us your questions or follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Wild Health MD. And just to be clear, this is not medical advice. No patient-physician relationship has been established, and this resource is really for general informational purposes only. And finally, if you want to spread the word, 
please send this podcast to friends and family and give us a review on iTunes. Thanks again and stay safe.